Okay, so thanks everyone for joining us today for our very first seminar of the semester. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce John Luc. John Luc is a professor in the Department of Mathematics at University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, his research focuses on biogenic mixing, fluid dynamics, and microfluid mixing. So today he will share with us some of the related work about shake your hips, an active particle with a fluctuating propulsion force. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Did that work? Yep. Okay. So let's go into presentation mode. You're you're reminding me, Ying, that I should update my topics of interest on, on my web page, right? These are like my interest in microfluid is seems a bit ancient now, so I should, oh. I should probably update my, <laughs> my, <bad. laughs> my research uh, interests on my web page. Oh well. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. I wish I could be with all of Austin. Oh, my colleague earlier, and I was reminded that uh, I was very impressed with Thomas Phi a few years ago when I, I ran the Boston Marathon, and Thomas managed to take a picture of me. He didn't even know I was running, um, and then suddenly he saw me and had the the wherewithal to take a picture of uh, of me finishing the Boston Marathon all wet. Uh, it was the worst year to run it. It was wet and cold, but it was actually a really good picture. It was one of the best pictures I got I have of this marathon. So thanks again, Thomas. <laughs> so um, I'm going to be telling you about very much a modeling talk in the sense that I'm not going to claim any kind of much realism and trying to be model modeling a specific biological system. Um, this is merely kind of a, a mathematical model that I'm going to try to like, try to analyze to death in some sense, and hope hopefully eventually we can, you know I can go back and try to fit it to some biological systems. But the work is still more in its modeling phase, and I haven't really thought of where to exactly um, fit this. And so this is work with Jia Jia Guo, who's a grad student. Uh, she was a grad student in Madison, a master's student, but now she's doing her PhD in Michigan. Um, so my main interest is going to be the two-dimensional so-called active Brownian particle model, which is a very popular model for doing active matter. Um, and it's basically is almost a Brownian particle, right? In the sense that you, you have several components of this, you have a position and an angle. I'm going to be doing everything in 2D because it's so much cleaner, but you could do a, all of what I'm going to do in 3D. And there are two vectors to distinguish vectors, the parallel and the perpendicular vector, which are, this is going to be the direction of swimming, and this is going to be the direction perpendicular to the direction of swimming. And you can see this here that x dot is u swim times p parallel. So there is a, a tendency to swim along this so-called parallel direction. And the parallel direction makes an angle phi with the x axis. But then you add a bunch of noises in this to allow for some randomness, so there's positional noise or spatial noise. So there's one in the parallel direction and there's one in the perpendicular direction. Okay, where w, w dot here are so-called uh, Wiener processes or just Brownian motions. Um, but then you also give a rule for how the angle evolves. So the angle of swimming is phi. This angle evolves according to its own Brownian motion called rotational diffusion. So here dr is called the rotational diffusion it's almost like a spatial diffusion, except it has units of one over time instead of length squared over time. And here, omega is the possibility of a, of a kind of bias, meaning maybe the particle likes to rotate in a particular direction, which actually happens in biology because there's lots of imperfections in biological systems. So very often one flagellum is stronger than the other flagellum, for instance, and the organism might tend to rotate in a preferred direction. Okay. Um, Right, so I think I've said everything. And this is just a, a kind of shotgun spread of references involving this model, but it's really quite a popular model that's been used for many years. It is not particularly good for some organisms because it doesn't have run and tumble, right? It doesn't have, it doesn't have long correlated motion before selecting a new random direction. So it tends to be useful for certain classes of organism or actually, um, um, artificial particles also tend to obey this model better than natural particles, like genus particles. 
Okay, so what's my interest in this model? Well, it started uh, maybe a year and a half ago when I started working with Giagia. And, uh, you know, we, there's always this thing, you know, if, you, if you're coming from outside the field where you say, well, we should probably just quickly redrive this model from sort of first principles and just see where it comes from. And that turns out to be a bit more of an adventure than I thought, partly because we did it the wrong way, I wanna say. Um, but I think the, the wrong way we did it is actually kind of an interesting way. Because instead of assuming some kind of thermal bath that the particle is immersed in, we instead modeled an active particle as some strange and any given shape. And this is your parallel and your perpendicular direction and your angle phi. But then we modeled the propulsion as a fluctuating force. So instead of having an ambient bath that's providing some kind of um, thermal noise, our noise is actually gonna come from the fluctuating force itself, which is not necessarily thermal, right? There's not really any reason why this fluctuating force should have some thermodynamics associated with it because this organism could be quite big, for instance. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't need to be in, um, in thermal equilibrium. So this fluctuating force, which is basically meant to model a flagellum acting at a single point, is decomposed into different bits. There's F parallel and F perp here are the deterministic bit of this force. So F parallel in particular would be what causes swimming, right? Because it is the thing that is pushing you in some given direction. But of course, then I'm putting some noise on the, for on, on the, on the force, which again, it might be due to molecular motors inside of the, inside of the particle or something like this, okay? And then um, there's also a perpendicular noise for the same reason, right? So there's a perpendicular component of the force, which is going to cause a torque. And this com perpendicular component is also allowed to have its own noise, okay? And just for simplicity, I'm gonna take these two noises to be independent, um, but they don't necessarily have to be, right? And, and P parallel and P perp are basically the same vectors as previous. So this force is acting at a point that I call LB parallel in the frame of the swimmer. And this is, um, and there's a distinguished point which here we draw in the middle called the center of reaction um, in, the, in the swimmer. This is a little bit different than a center of mass because it's the kind of fluid dynamical equivalent of the center of mass in some sense. Um, so we're going to assume that our propelled particle here obeys um, a drag, a linear drag law, which I say after neglecting some terms. So let me just say what this linear drag law is. It's saying that you know the acceleration or the force m times acceleration is a linear drag with a matrix k, which is called the resistance matrix, times the velocity plus a fluctuating force which is given by this thing above. And similarly, there's a rotational equation, which is the moment of inertia times the angular velocity dot, right? The rate of change of the angular velocity is a rotational drag and then a torque. Okay. And the reason that I say neglecting some terms is because there are some extra terms that can go into this drag equation, uh, in particular, the one involving the fluid inertia. And really we should, we, you know, we're hoping to find a way to incorporate this into our model to make it more realistic. But right now we just don't have those terms. So we're going to follow a lot of authors and just assume a linear drag to keep things simple. Um, and the resistance matrix here is in the body frame of the swimmer is given by a diagonal matrix with a parallel um, drag and a perpendicular drag, a rotational drag. Um, and then Q is a rotation matrix that takes you between the body frame and the lab frame basically, right? So Q is, a, is a, a two by two rotation matrix by the angle phi, okay? And so the main point is that this force exerts a torque, right? Because, because of course it does. And that torque is given by the perpendicular component of the force, okay? It's basically a cross product of this vector um, times the force. So you're picking up only the perpendicular component of the force, okay? I'm gonna pause briefly to make sure, are there any questions uh, before I go on? Everybody understands the basic setup? Okay. So I would like to derive an, an active Brownian particle limit to this, which means that things are no longer overdamped in the, sorry, which is the overdamped limit of this equation. 
So when you take a small mass and a small mode of inertia, we'll see below that you get a kind of balance between acceleration and force and rotational velocity and torque. And that becomes the active Brownian particle model. Okay. But before I do that, let me point out there's already some differences between this model and the standard active Brownian particle model. And the difference is between is having to do with correlations. Because my torque here depends on the perpendicular noise, right? Whereas in the active Brownian particle model, the torque is an independent Brownian motion. And of course, that makes sense, right? If your fluctuating force is changing in time, it's going to both cause a propulsion, which will turn your particle, but it's also going to cause a torque at the same time. So in this kind of setup for the active Brownian particle model, there is a correlation between rotation and um, the rotation of the particle and how it turns as it goes. So you can see that visually in stochastic simulations. So these are just very simple Brownian simulations. The one in the box is the usual ABP model. And I, I list all the parameters here. It's not terribly important. There's no built-in rotation, small mass and moment of inertia. So we're in the overdamped limit, roughly. Uh, parallel uh, drag equal to this, and all the other ones are equal to one. So, and the swimming velocity is, is a unit, unit velocity. And you can see that the, the model that I've shown here has a sort of different looking sort of path, right? It's not quite as spiky as the active Brownian particle model for this parameter regime. Again, these are all the same parameters, but the only difference is the, the correlation in this force, right? I can play a movie to sort of show you what it looks like a little bit. We'll be seeing lots of movies of these Brownian particle simulations. These are very, I kind of call them Brownian particle simulations, but that's a glorified name for just doing, you know, the simplest thing you can do, right? Just uh, generating random Gaussian numbers and adding them at the increments. Okay. And okay, so that's I'm roughly not... what the paths look like. Sorry yes. to interrupt. So sure. could you just say one more time? So where exactly do these correlations come from? I mean, I understand that you're generating these sort of stochastic forces corresponding to both the perpendicular and, and parallel direction, but I, I didn't quite make the connection of how is this different than... Yeah, let me, let me reiterate again. So here there are three Brownian motions, right? There's oh, the, I see. I see. a noise that's parallel, a noise that's perpendicular, and a rotational noise, which is different, right? I see. So now, but if you, now put the, you have three. Exactly. If you put the fluctuations in the force, then it's the force that's turning the particles, and the force only has two fluctuations. And so Notice that the torque now has a fluctuating part, and that's what's turning the particle. That's what appears in the rotational model. So the rotational diffusivity is not independent from the translational diffusivities anymore. Okay. So, and of course, as you'd expect, this leads to kind of different looking paths. Okay. So our goal here is going to be to analyze those paths and show that you have to be a little bit careful in the analysis. Well, actually you have to be a lot careful in the analysis in the sense that if you just do the overdamped limit naively, you really get the completely wrong answer, even at order one. Whereas, and, and because you have to take care of the correlations carefully. So I will sort of walk you through how to derive the overdamped limit, taking into account these correlations properly and to see what that predicts about the model. For instance, it'll predict uh, a different type of diffusivity tensor as you get in the active Brownian particle model. And there'll also be some noise induced drift that shows up that's not present in the basic uh, active Brownian particle model. Okay. So let's look at the standard stochastic differential equation form of these equations. So when I say standard SDE, I mean that typically people write an SDE as, you know, DDT of something is kind of a, uh, an advective term, if you will, plus a noise term. And then there's a matrix coupling the noise to the, to the variables, right? So now I'm introducing a lot of notation at once. So let's be a little careful here. The hats are always gonna represent quantities that include both position and angle. So just a convenient way of rewriting everything together. So in other words, U hat here is the velocity, but also the angular velocity. And X hat is the position, but also the, the angle. Um, that, that rule doesn't really apply to the noise, but so W dot here is just a two dimensional noise because there's only two, two noises, whereas these are three vectors, right? Okay. And so basically we're seeing dx dt is U 
that's the both the equation that you know the x dt is uh, um, is the physical velocity and d phi dt is omega right that's basically what this first equation is saying okay and then what are the other things well the other things are just matrices giving us the couplings properly so the b hat matrix is a kind of scaled resistivity matrix um, so it has both the translational part and the rotational part which are scaled both by the mass of the particle and by the moment of inertia of the particle and then the u hat here is the combination of the swimming velocity and this rotational velocity but it's actually related to the forces that we introduced in the previous slide right because now my swimming is actually due to a propul propulsion force so the swimming velocity is the mobility tensor which is the inverse of the resistance matrix times the force and same thing for the rotation right the rotational rate is related to the perpendicular force through the torque lf perp divided by the resistivity okay and so this matrix sigma here ends up having this triangular form because the triangular form comes again from this correlation right this off diagonal term here is saying that it is the perpendicular noise that is causing rotation in the normal abp model this would be a diagonal matrix but in this model it's a it's a, a skew matrix because of this coupling okay um and don't forget that p parallel and p perp are functions of phi so a priori this looks like this could be what's called multiplicative noise right in this in the stochastic differential equations literature and in langevin equation literature people talk of multiplicative noise when the noise matrix here depends on the state variables okay and i'll tell you why in a second this is actually looks like multiplicative noise but it actually isn't okay but let me just point out a bit of terminology whenever a matrix or a vector or a matrix is wearing a hat it's a three by three matrix or a three vector and i'll often call these grand quantities like grand um, the grand resistance tensor etc which is fairly standard notation okay again feel free to interrupt if there's any any questions there's kind of a lot of notation here i apologize for that that's the problem with math so okay. sorry yeah. again just a simple question this the two lowercase u and capital u so you swim is this kind of the the speed that the particle would be swimming at if it weren't rotating or how should i imagine the difference between yeah that's right if it, if it didn't have any noises right so the, the velocity little u includes noises right whereas capital u is the deterministic part of the velocity yeah it's the mean velocity if you will also at least it's the mean velocity assuming that everything can be averaged properly right and that's what we'll see in some sense not quite that simple okay right so let's talk about the overnet limit and i've got the word dubious here it's not always dubious right i don't mean i don't mean to thrash everything about the overdamp limit but in this case it is dubious because in the overdamp limit what you say is that well the mass is small right the mass is buried in these tensors here but roughly speaking it means the acceleration of the particle can be neglected and so the the balance is between the drag term and the noise and so you you can use this to solve for u hat right when you set this to zero you can solve for u hat and then you insert this in here and you get basically something that looks a lot like the active brownian particle model because you have an equation for dx dt and uh, d phi dt equal to this plus some noise matrix and this is what gives you d parallel and d perp right the noise the noise is involved in the in the problem okay so it's very close to the standard mvp model except here there's only two of these noises so even this matrix here is not quite of the form that i showed in the original active brownian particle model so this this way of doing things recovers almost the active brownian particle model except for the fact that the noise matrix is a little bit different However, um, and this would result in non a non-diagonal diffusion tensor here. The difference would be a non-diagonal diffusion tensor representing that coupling between the different types of diffusions. Okay, I'm not explicitly giving it here because I'll return to it later, but that would be the only difference at this point if this was the way to do things, okay. which would already be interesting, by the way. But 
It turns out that doing this is a terrible idea. Well, it's a terrible idea if you're interested in doing math correctly. It probably is useful as a modeling thing anyways, right? But um, because when you model, you, 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 you do what you can to get what you want, right? So maybe that's useful in some limits. But strictly speaking, in the derivation I'm not doing here, this is incorrect. And the reason it's incorrect is kind of interesting. Um, this looks like multiplicative noise, as I said earlier, because this is a function of the state variables. But it's not because it's only a function of phi of the, of the translational noise, sorry, of the, of the rotational position. And to get multiplicative noise, it's not just that the, this depends on the state variables. There's this, there's this term called the Stratonovich drift term that you can compute. And it turns out that for this particular combination of the way phi's enter the system, the Stratonovich drift vanishes exactly. So in fact, this is not actually multiplicative noise, which is in some sense good news, right? It means that you can simulate this any way you want without having to worry about noise correlations, et cetera. There's no Ito versus Stratonovich interpretation problem, which always you know, makes my head hurt whenever we get to this kind of problem. So at first you're happy, but the problem is that the equation that you've derived using the overdamped limit has multiplicative noise. Because once you do the overdamped limit, you've got now this tensor, which, which depends on the state variables, multiplying the noise. And if you compute the Ito versus Stratonovich kind of term or the, the Stratonovich drift term of this matrix, it's non-zero. So the overdamped limit has caused multiplicative noise to happen. Okay. It's a, really, it's a bit of a tricky thing. When you have stochastic differential equations, it is dangerous to multiply by state variables because you're changing the noise when you do so. You're creating multiplicative noise. So at this point, it's not clear that this is necessarily wrong, but it's at least suspicious because you started with additive noise where you don't have to worry about Ito versus Tritonovich, and you end up, ended with colored noise where now you do have to decide which one of these interpretations you should do. And of course, I don't want to do that, right? I don't, I don't want to pick an interpretation without knowing why. So it is much better to start from this equation and properly do the reduction to an equation like this and then it will tell me whether I should, I should take Ito or Stratonovich. The answer is it's, it's going to be neither, okay? In the sense that it's not true that every time it's either Ito or Stratonovich, sometimes it's something weird and there's nothing you can do about it. So the limiting case of this equation is not going to be the active Brownian particle model of this form. Okay. But I just want to point out in this slide that there's at least something shady going on, right? Because if you start with additive noise and you end up with multiplicative noise, you, you, you should be a little worried. Okay. Right. So care is thus required in taking the overdamped limit. So the question is, how do you do it? Well, there's more than one way to do this, um, but I'm a fundamentally kind of a person who loves PDEs, and I would rather work on PDEs than work on stochastic differential equations. It's just a, it's a professional, it's a professional bias. And so for me, a natural way of doing this limit is instead to start with this original system, right? The big system and write down its so-called Foucault-Planck equation, which is a kind of equivalent equation, but that tells you about the evolution of a probability density of particles rather than giving you trajectories of individual particles. Um, and so the Foucault-Planck equation looks like this. You, you basically read it off from the stochastic process. It's an equation for a probability density P which is a function of everything. It's a function of uh, x hat and u hat and time. And it tells you the probability density of finding the particle with position x hat and velocity u hat at time t. Um, when I say position x hat, I mean position and orientation, of course, right? So this is, so it really has six independent um, parameters, right? x, y, phi, and then two velocity components and a uh, rotational velocity and then time. So it has seven, P is a function of seven things here. And again, as I said, you read it off because you see the drift here is equal to U hat in the X direction. So there's a U hat drift corresponds to the X direction. And there's a, there's a B dot U hat drift in the U hat direction, but I've cheated a bit. I have pulled out some of these extra terms into an operator I call L, which is, the remaining terms, right? So b hat dot little u hat lives here. And then the noise terms gives you a diffusion matrix here. 
So this is a second order derivative. This is basically the, 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 the tensorial second derivative where this is a, a direct product. And then E hat here is one half sigma hat times its transpose. And this is totally standard. How to go from this kind of equation to a Fourier Planck equation is just a completely standard thing. Um, and this is the place where this Ito versus Stratonovich uh, um, ambiguity would come in. You have to interpret this noise properly. And if it's a Stratonovich noise, there would be some additional drift term showing up. But of course, I've told you already, this is additive noise. So there is no such ambiguity at this point. So it's unambiguous then how to go from this equation to the Fokker Planck equation. So now why did I separate things out this way? Well, I'm anticipating now the overdamped limit. So I'm going to introduce a parameter epsilon. And I've peppered it through the equation in the way that I know is going to work out, right? This is how you do asymptotics. You, you try different scalings. And at the end, you get what's called the distinguished limit, right? Where, where the terms balance in the right way. But roughly speaking, the idea is that the, the velocity terms are kind of small. So if you divide by epsilon, for instance, you can see that this term is big. And that's the term that's causing the damping. Right? That's the term that causes things to relax to equilibrium rapidly. The, the fact that it's a squared here versus an epsilon is a question of how diffusion works. Uh, you're right, the fact that it's a second order, time is related to ddx squared, basically. Okay. So I kind of have reduced the analysis of the system to a PDE problem now, because I would like now to look at the um, solutions of this equation in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Or rather, I would like to look at an effective equation in, in the limit as epsilon goes to zero right? for a, sim a simplified version of this equation. And that'll tell me what the, what the over overdamped equation should be. Okay. By the way, double dot here is the double dot product. This is useful when you have symmetric tensors, right? That it doesn't really matter. This is symmetric and this is symmetric. So it just means that you take, you contract the indices twice. Okay. So now we do what we love, we do asymptotics. So we start, we expand our probability density P as some expansion in powers of epsilon, where epsilon is the small collisional parameter. You can think of epsilon as the mass of the particle, for instance, right? It's just a question, it, it doesn't really matter where the fast time scale comes from. Okay, so at leading order, we just have L P zero is zero, where I remember, remind you that the operator L is this thing. Okay, so you can think of L, I think of L as the collisional operator when you do kinetic theory. It's the, it's the thing, it's the fast interactions between uh, the degrees of freedom. And normally what would happen if you, by the way, if we were doing completely thermal stuff, if, if there were none of these correlations, the solution here would just be a standard Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So things are gonna be a little bit different because you, can, you, not, you now try to write P0 as some Quantity depends only on x hat and t, plus a quantity depends on, on u hat. L really only is, an, is a differential operator that only depends on u hat, in the sense that it only acts on the u hat, on the, on the velocity. Okay. And again, if, the, if things were completely Maxwellian, this would be just a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. But here the solution, and I'm not going to give you the details of the solution, but it's the so-called invariant density for an ornstein ullenbeck process. And it looks like this, which you might think looks a lot like a Maxwellian in the sense that it has, you know, E to the minus a half velocity dot a matrix dot velocity. So this is like an energy, right? So this looks a lot like a Maxwellian. The difference is in the A. A is, I didn't tell you what A is yet. A is the solution to a so-called uh, continuous time Lyapunov problem. So this is the sort of thing that shows up when you insert um, these kind of non-thermal noises, if you will, non-diagonal D uh, diffusion tensor into, into the equation is you, you, you still get a, a Gaussian solution, but the Gaussian solution now has a different kind of tensor in its representation. And that tensor A is the solution to this problem. This is also called a kind of Sylvester equation in mathematics. And it's a very nice equation. It's a matrix equation, right? So A is the unknown matrix here. E is the diffusion matrix. I'm calling the diffusion matrix E because it's a momentum diffusion matrix. And later on, I'm gonna have a, a spatial diffusion matrix D, right? So E is the diffusion of momentum still. Um, 
And B here is something related to the damping to the, to the um, resistance matrix, right? Just a bit rescaled, but it's basically the resistance matrix. So you have to solve this equation. It's not difficult, but if A and B commute, then you recover the sort of thermal limit. But here A and B don't commute because of these correlations that I have in my system. Okay, so again, when B commutes with E, it's either when B commutes with E and the same as B commutes with A, those are the same, it turns out. But that would be the kind of simple case, the, the thermal case, um, which is kind of what you do in the overdamp limit that we saw, the, the, the simple-minded overdamp limit that we saw earlier. Okay, so to do it properly, you have to solve this equation. Sorry, Jean-Luc, there, there's a question in the chat or a request, oh. which is please go back one slide so we can sure. see B and E in the Fokker-Planck equation. Yeah. yeah, sorry, E is the yeah. momentum diffusion matrix. Subtorsh, so, you, you can talk if you have any. Uh, yeah, so I don't see the, because I'm sharing my whole screen, I, I don't see the. We, we got it, uh, Thomas, thank you. We were just trying to figure out what B and E are, got it. Okay, sorry, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. It's it's a problem. This is a talk with a lot of notation. I apologize for this. It's it's hard to simplify this. So let me just remind you that B is basically just a resistance matrix. It, it's got a, a few rescalings by mass or something in it, but it's roughly, roughly speaking, the resistance matrix involving both the translational and the rotational degrees of freedom. And then E is the diffusion tensor, but it represents the diffusion of, of momentum, if you will, right? not yet of space okay. because it's the it's the noise and the force if you remember right so it's really it's really about momentum diffusion more than it, it's it's the force you know it's a for it's a noise and the force perfect we got it uh sean uh, the thing is that the, this is a bunch of physicists at one end of the computer and for us e is temperature and b is friction and I, we just wanted to make sure which is which yeah yeah exactly yeah I'm, i i was trying to use some of the standard notation but um yeah, you run out of letters quickly. And, and again, the reason I'm using E is usually you would use a diffusion tensor D here, but it's momentum diffusion. And later on, there will be spatial diffusion. I reserve D for spatial diffusion. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So now we have to solve this Sylvester problem, which is a standard thing in um, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, by the way. Um, in fact, there's some nice existing functions, just to point out, if you're, un if you're unaware of these, Mathematica has a nice function called the Apanov solve, and uh, MATLAB has a function called Sylvester uh, for solving these things directly. So it's very easy. It would not be hard otherwise, you just have to turn A into a column vector, and then you can solve this, right? So it's not particularly hard to solve, but it's just convenient. There's already some existing code, and particularly Mathematica is nice because then you get an analytic solution. And for this problem, you can actually solve the thing explicitly. The matrix A, so you can think of A as a kind of generalized sort of inverse, a generalized inertia tensor in some sense. Um, because again, in the standard, in the standard, if things were thermal, this would be a diagonal matrix where roughly speaking, this would be like one over mass, one over mass, one over moment of inertia. And it would be the regular matrix that you see in a Maxwellian. Um, but here it looks a bit different. Well, it looks completely different because of this, in part because of this coupling. And so this coupling between the degrees of freedom that I mentioned before shows up as the off diagonal terms in this matrix. Here, remember Q is a rotation matrix. So I'm just presenting the answer in the, in the frame of the particle, but then you have to rotate it back to the lab frame uh, for the calculations. Okay, where Q hat here is just a, a rotation matrix with, a, with an extra one appended to it. Okay. Um, not too important, right, to see all these details, to, to remember all these details, but I'm just giving you the presentation. So now it gets trickier because we have to go to the next order in our expansion. So in some sense, we found the equilibrium of the particles, and now we need to continue to see what, what's going to happen around this equilibrium, right? Because we're interested in time evolution of these quantities. And so you have to solve at order one, and again, this is going to be very fast. I'm not expecting you to follow all of the details, but you know, you always get this thing where the, the L operator is the linear operator that shows up at every order acting on your current order. And then the previous orders act as a kind of forcing on this high order, okay? And you have to solve this. And that's not so easy. Um, it's the linear problem, so there's some hope. Turns out you can rewrite the solution in terms of two pieces involving 
still unknown functions chi one and chi two. And here I'm introducing the triple product, which is not too commonly used, but you know sometimes you just need more dots. So that just means there's a you know there's three quantities here to be dotted because a is a matrix and x is a vector, but but chi two is completely symmetric in all its indices. So it doesn't matter in which order you do this. Um, and chi one and chi two are fairly simple problems to solve. L chi one is your velocity times the, the equilibrium distribution. Phi, phi is like your quote unquote Maxwellian. And L chi two is a kind of higher order Maxwellian. So it's a three tensor that you have to solve for this. Okay. So the first one is actually really easy to solve. Um, you just can solve it directly. The second one is the tougher one, um, but it turns out you don't actually need to solve completely because you, you just, you, you're just going to need to know one of its moments later on. You don't actually need chi two, you're just gonna need a moment of chi two. And therefore it's actually not necessary to solve for chi two. You can do something a little bit more uh, indirect. Okay, so um, let me just proceed to the last order. Again, I'm sorry to do this kind of explicit um, asymptotic calculation, but I just wanna show it quickly and then I'll show you the results. So the point is that the last order, it looks like that, where now our rescaled time is finally showing up, right? Um, and we need to apply what's called a solvability condition, which we also had to do with the previous order, but I didn't mention it because it was not relevant. But the solvability condition is integrating over velocities everywhere. Okay, so meaning integrating over the domain of velocities completely. And if you do this, if you integrate this equation over velocities, you get this equation, which is a kind of evolution of the probability density of positions only. P contains only the positions, not the velocities. And then some kind of divergence of a flux. And that involves an average itself of P1, which is the previous solution that we found at the previous order. So let me just recall what P1 looked like. P1 was made up of the sum of these two things. So that means I really need to average my chi's to get this thing. And so I can do that. The first one is easy because I have a direct solution. I just get this. And the second one is the one I mentioned was a bit tricky, but we only need its correlation. So we only need to calculate this four tensor here multiplied by B inverse. And again, there's some tricks to use here, but at the end of the day, it's basically the fourth moment for a Gaussian variable, which can be done explicitly in terms of some kind of symmetrized version of A hat. So now we wrap it all together to bring it back into this flux. And that gives, us, um, that gives us the equation that I was looking for. So again, I don't expect anybody to sort of follow all the steps of the derivation, but I just wanted to show roughly how it went. So now we get a big Fokker-Planck equation for capital P. And I'll remind you what the difference is, is that capital P now only involves positions and angles. There's no velocities anymore. So this is an overdamped limit, okay? And it contains the thing you would expect, dt of p. There's a divergence of the swimming velocity times p, but there's a new term here, which I'll talk about in a second, and that's a noise-induced drift. There's a angular term, right, corresponding to the tendency of this thing to want to rotate. And then finally, there's a big diffusion term with now a spatial diffusion matrix, d. So d is a tensor. Okay, a three by three tensor in this case, right? Because it's got the hat, okay? And here I refer to noise-induced drift references, but it's just a kind of general thing. This, this is not really, this result was not derived in those papers. It's just general papers that discuss similar types of noise-induced drifts, often because the environment is non-uniform, for instance, you get, you get noise-induced drift. Um, so the new factor here is this, addition to the swimming velocity, which is this noise term, okay? And notice that it vanishes for a sort of pseudo spherical particle, meaning if you have sigma parallel equal to sigma perp, then this term is not there, okay? So this extra effect now that is being predicted by this limiting process of the stochastic equation really only appears when you have non-spherical particles which is interesting, but as I mentioned later, I mean, since a lot of these calculations in the literature often deal with spherical particles, um, this term might have been missed in some limits, I'm not sure, but it really only shows up for non-spherical particles. So it's an extra swimming 
because it's in the direction of p parallel, which is the same direction of the swimming velocity. Okay. And then finally, there's also the diffusion tensor, which, as I mentioned before, now has the feature that it's not purely diagonal. And now I've rewritten it in the most familiar version, meaning d parallel, d perp, dr. Those are exactly the diffusivities that appear in the, the active Brownian particle model. But the difference is that there's an off diagonal coupling coming from the fact that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if the force fluctuates in order to turn the particle, it also creates a diffusion. It, it, it causes both a translation and a diffusion. So there's a coupling between the perpendicular diffusivity and the rotational diffusivity. And here are all the definitions. The parallel diffusivity is related to this momentum diffusivity, similarly for perpendicular one. And then the rotational diffusivity is not independent, right? It also depends on E perp. Well, it's independent in that it depends on sigma r, right? So it, it could have very different values. This is the rotational drag, and this is the perpendicular drag. Okay. Notice, by the way, the determinant of this matrix is zero, which could cause some concern. First of all, it's not surprising because you only have two noises and you have three variables. So it has to be a singular diffusion tensor. So you might worry about this because it means it's a kind of ill-posed problem from the point of view of diffusion. But that's not really a problem because you can add a little bit of thermal noise um, to everything to regularize the problem. In other words, there's always going to be a way to achieve equilibrium with thermal noise. And this is the noise due to the flagellum. So in practice, it's not actually as big a, uh, an issue as you might think, the fact that this tensor is, is singular. OK, so let's talk about this noise-induced drift a little bit. Um, so it's an extra swimming speed. Um, and notice that this term is still present even when the mass of the particle or the inertia is small. The mass and the inertia only show up here. And they're in, the, in the limit as m goes to 0, in other words, this noise-induced drift doesn't vanish. So that's what I meant when I said it's an order 1 issue in the overdamp limit. It isn't something that becomes small as you let the overdamp limit, as you let the a particle becomes smaller or, some, or lighter. Okay, so, so there really is an order one problem in taking the overdamp limit as, as we saw earlier, the, the simple-minded overdamp limit. Um, and what it means also is that if I set the actual swimming speed to zero, so I have a, a non-swimmer, it will still swim according to this swimming velocity. And we'll see that in a second, that you can, you can make particles that because of where the torque is applied on the particle, they will still appear to swim even though they don't have an, uh, a natural deterministic propulsion mechanism. OK. And again, this goes away if the particle is isotropic, which, yeah, is interesting. OK. Um, you can compute Peclet numbers, and you can convince yourself that this, is, this scales in terms of the L. L is the point where you apply the force, if you remember, in the body frame. And A is the size of the particle. So this number, this, Peckle, this perpendicular Peckley number is never large, right? Because it's impossible to, L, the biggest L can be is A, basically, because you, you have to apply your force within the body, right? So this perpendicular number is of order one, or it's small if you don't apply a torque at all. Whereas the rotational number is the opposite, which is interesting. So it can be very large. Okay. Um, yeah, that's basically what is basically what I'm saying here. Okay, so I need to derive some consequences of this new drift term and of this new rotational diffusivity term. And the best thing that I know how to do is to compute what's called the effective diffusivity of this problem. So if you if you release these particles, they'll start swimming around. And over time, they will, they will approximate a diffusion equation. Even though they're swimming, they will go, go around in kind of loops and et cetera. But the long-term limit of this is still a diffusion equation. And you can compute explicitly what the effective diffusivity of this process is for long times. Okay, So there are two new effects here, this noise and news drift and this coupling term. And the question is, how do they, how do they affect this long time effective diffusivity of the particles. Okay, so you can compute this effective diffusivity by starting again from your overdumped Fokker Planck equation, 
and doing a kind of time rescaling and doing yet another asymptotic expansion. But this time involving the fact that you want to wait for long times and large scales and examine the behavior of the equation in that limit. Okay. So you introduce yet another small parameter, which labels what you mean by a large scale and what you mean by a long time. And they have to be re related again by delta inverse versus delta to minus two because of diffusion, right? One, one space derivative is equal to two times, no, one, two times derivative, two space derivatives balance one time derivative. Okay. So in other words, you replace your time derivative by this, where T is a kind of slow time scale, and you replace your X derivative by this, where capital X now is, is called a long spatial scale. And then you make a new asymptotic expansion for your problem which basically will assume that the angle finds its equilibrium very quickly and, or uh, sorry, randomizes fairly quickly, right? Because the angle has nowhere to go. So if you wait a long time, the angle is gonna explore its domain quite a few times, right? So it will naturally achieve its invariant density much faster than spatial terms, which are just spreading out, okay? So I, I see I just, here, I just say, we, I kind of, I'm telling you that it's going to look like this, basically, but you can, you can justify why it looks like this by doing the calculation. But I'm not going to do the asymptotic expansion because we've already seen one asymptotic expansion, and I think there should be a limit of one per talk. I think even one is too many, probably. So I'm not going to do the asymptotic expansion here, but I'm just telling you what the scaling would be. And then you get, indeed, an effective diffusion equation. So... And again, this is an equation that's valid for very long times and very large scales, where very is not that large, but still. And it predicts, as you would expect, an isotropic diffusivity now, right? Because there's no, if you wait a long time, of course, there's no orientation in this problem, right? So things randomize and everything becomes a scalar isotropic problem. And you can predict exactly what this effective diffusivity should be. It should look something like this. Okay, it involves all the parameters here. W now is the sum of the swimming velocity and the noise-induced drift, okay? But just for comparison, this is what it looks like in the ABP model, okay? Um, in the ABP model, the difference is that there's a W squared here, W times W is the analog, the analog of the swimming velocity squared. Everything else is kind of the same, but except there's an extra term here. So the difference is that you have to take into account the swimming velocity and the noise, but the other difference comes from the coupling in the, in the diffusivity matrix and gives you an extra diffusivity. Okay. Okay. So, and we've confirmed these by numerical simulation. This is all, this is all correct. All right. So to really, really isolate what's happening here, I think it's useful to look at a particle that I call a wiggler. Um, a wiggler is a particle that doesn't swim. Okay, but you do put this force off center, so it picks up a noise induced drift, right? So it's trying to shake from left to right. It has no parallel swimming at all. It's just trying to shake from left to right. That's why I refer to it as shaking its hips. It's a particle that's kind of has some kind of force, an oscillating propulsion force that's only acting laterally. Okay, um, and if it wasn't for this noise induced drift, it wouldn't go anywhere, it would just diffuse. Um, so I, 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 I've been calling it a wiggler, but maybe there's enough of these cute names in this literature, so I'm not necessarily proposing this, but it looks a bit like a treadmiller, which is another kind of particle that's being suggested in literature, which doesn't really swim. It has this kind of neutral thing, and then the, tr the treadmiller in the literature can swim by interactions with boundaries, for instance, but by itself, it doesn't actually swim. So for the wiggler, things simplify a little bit. You can write down this diffusivity more explicitly. Um, and it looks like this. Oh, this is the added diffusivity on top of the molecular diffusivity, by the way. This is not the bare diffusivity. So this is the added diffusivity on top of molecular. But here's the thing that's very interesting. It can be negative, right? This term here can be positive or negative, depending on whether your particle is prolate or oblate. So prolate particles will have added diffusivity due to this and oblate particles will have reduced diffusivity due to this effect. So that's very surprising to me, right? Because it's actually very hard to reduce diffusivity of a particle 
Like if you have some molecular noise, right? It's hard to imagine how adding the swimming would reduce the diffusivity. So to convince you of this, I kind of have to show you movies and simulations. So this is, this is the prolate particle. Uh, so this one has added diffusivity, right? And so if you look at it, well, again, this thing is not swimming in the sense that if it wasn't for the noise-induced drift, it would not have any natural propulsion forward. It would just diffuse. But you can kind of see that this particle does look a bit like a swimmer, right? It does get this net propulsion. And that's all due to the correlations between noise that are being created. But if you ask me, I would say this particle is diffusing fairly fast on average because, because of this added swimming. Again, in, in general, added swimming always causes the particle to diffuse faster. Okay. So this part is not too surprising. Okay. There's a similar effect, by the way, that's been reported by Eric Loga about enhanced diffusivity in a non swimming particle, but it's, it's related, but not the same, I would say. So now let me show you what the oblate one does. So, how can the oblate have a reduced diffusivity? It's a bit funny. You can almost see it in the movies, right? So, it has a swimming. But it tend it you know it, it doesn't really appear it's a statistical swimming right so you, you can't really it's a, it's an average swimming so so the, the the devil is in the details as far as what actually happens and you can kind of see that because of the way the force is acting on this particle it ends up liking to take trajectories along circles along arcs of circles and that ends up slowing down the molecular diffusivity. It causes the particle to kind of retrace its steps a bit too much, and it gets it to be trapped uh, in the, along these circular trajectories. So these, so the trajectories tend to be circular arcs. I can tell you, if you ask me, I can tell you why they're circular arcs. But uh, it, it, at, at first, it's really bothered me, but now I think it's actually correct. I don't think there's any swimmer in nature that actually does something like this that looks a little bit artificial. But the mathematical model predicts this in, the, in this strange limit. So it's those very feathery looking trajectories. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I call this effect a little bit like over-rotating, like it, it tries to rotate, but it, it spends a lot of its time. Um, well, I, this is actually in reference to a paper by Ta uh, Takaji et al, um, where particles tend to take these very, very curvy trajectories that end up suppressing diffusion because they, they do so many loops on themselves, if you will. OK, but now there's something even more interesting or equally interesting, I think. It's also possible for the diffusivity to actually vanish in this case. The effective diffusivity can actually vanish because it can. I told you this added term can be negative, but it can be negative enough so that the particle doesn't have any diffusivity. The model predicts that this thing doesn't diffuse at all, which I didn't think was possible. But um, so I call this a neutral active particle. It can only diffuse um, if it had some d parallel, but I'm setting d parallel to zero in this case, or it could diffuse with thermal noise. But the trajectories tell you a little bit, I think they suggest why it doesn't diffuse. Um, you're going to see that all the parameters are just right, that the particle almost wants to stay on a circle for very long times. It really likes to be on this, on this kind of circular trajectories. Now, it doesn't mean that it won't diffuse at all. Because when you do one of these expansions, diffusion is just a second order effect, right? There could be a fourth order diffusion. And you usually never talk about the fourth order effect of diffusion because it's swamped by the second order in some sense. But this is an example of a particle that could only diffuse through a fourth derivative with respect to x in some sense, right? The, the only way it could, it will eventually get somewhere on average. But it'll, be, but it'll be because of the expected value of x to the fourth, because the, the expected value of x squared on average will, tend to, will, not, will not grow in time. Okay, so it's a bit of a funny particle. Again, this is not a part that I'm claiming would have some, some analog in the natural world, though I guess it would be interesting if there was, or if you could manufacture a particle that does this, for instance, it'd be quite interesting. Okay, so maybe I'll skip this thing about the, there's also an interesting effect that the, the actual value of this effective, this effective diffusivity is independent of, what, of the point where you apply the torque, which seems counterintuitive 
And then eventually you realize that the point where you apply the torque is just responsible for the length of a transient. So if you take the limit as L goes to zero, you're just setting up this longer and longer transient before this diffusive behavior sets in. Um, so it's, it's a kind of singular limit in some sense to take the limit as the point of application of the torque goes to zero. Okay, so I'm going to skip to my conclusions because it's been a while. So can we observe these kinds of corrections to an active Brownian particle model? In other words, can we make particles that do this, right? Um, so <clears throat> for instance, one reason why this could not, this certainly has not been seen before is because the, the people usually simulate the overdamped limit of the active Brownian particle directly, right? I think it's fairly rare that people start with the underdamped version because it's so computationally intensive to start with the underdamped version because of the small time scale associated with the with the with the diffusion uh, with the with the mass. So, <clears throat> so that might be one reason why no effect like this was has been spotted so far. But also, you have to specifically do particle simulations where you have anisotropy of the particles, right? Which historically, that people were not doing very much. Um, particle anisotropy, but the last 10, 15 years has been quite a bit more, right? I think that a lot of more of the uh, molecular simulations and things like that, or particle simulations are being done in, with, with anisotropic particles now. It's actually a big, a big field of interest. So maybe there's a chance that if some of the effects that I mentioned here uh, could be, could be uh, observed. And of course, experimentally, it's kind of hard to, to see what you would measure to see this effect, right? Because Experimentally, you can measure the diffusivity, but how do you disentangle, you know, what's caused by this added drift as opposed to the particle velocity, right? <clears throat> so maybe there's a way to measure the covariance matrix A directly. And if you could measure the covariance matrix A directly, you would more explicitly see this coupling effect, right, in the, in the diffusion tensor. And maybe you could, you could, you know, one could, conclude that the, the, the effects presented here are present. Um, yeah, and the faster the swimmers are, of course, the, lo the smaller the effect of this added drift is, of course. So you kind of have to pick a swimmer that has the right set of parameters, I think, to have a chance of measuring uh, these effects. OK, so some future work. Um, we are working on doing this for arbitrarily shaped three-dimensional particles. This turns out to be quite heavily, you know, there's a lot of angles to take care of because we really do want to take into account all three Euler angles so our particles can be of completely arbitrary shapes. It turns out that's mathematically um, much more tedious than I expected initially. Um, and of course, you could imagine many, many extensions of this. For instance, everything that I, met, I said here was kind of hinged on the idea that there's a single force and a single applied at a single point, but many organisms have multiple flagella. So for instance, to make one of these neutral particles, you could easily maybe put flagella at opposite, opposite ends of a particle. And then it would, not, it, it would not be a natural swimmer, but it would have all these correlation effects uh, that I discussed here. So it'd be interesting to see how you could use some of these correlation effects to modify some predictions from in, in, in different in different areas of, of active matter, uh, like this so-called swim pressure that uh, Takatori and Brady have written a lot about. Um, I am not sure exactly if we can predict some modification to run and tumble dynamics using this. That's one area that we're thinking of going. I've only looked at you know Brownian motion so far, but it would be interesting to instead put the integral operator corresponding to run and tumble dynamics and to see if it leads to modification. Of course, it's always interesting to put some non-Newtonian effects um, um, or a velocity-dependent friction, which is another, another possibility, or particle interactions, right? That's the big thing that's missing is that everything that I mentioned here was kind of for isolated particles. There's no interactions whatsoever. So the consequences to, uh, you know, to this on particle interactions is completely unknown. I have no idea if this is going to affect um, particle interactions in, in any way. Okay, and we have a preprint on this if you're interested, uh, available on the archive. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for such a nice talk.
please, uh, please feel free to ask you know, any questions if you have. <clears throat> So I can go ahead. I, I had one question. I mean, you're hinting at this a bit with talking about uh, the possibility of adding additional points where you could have forces. But another way of thinking about that is that here you've set L to be constant throughout your uh, throughout your model. But I guess in principle, L could also be some, some kind of stochastic variable. Um, would that sort of make the model also intractable in terms of the multiplicative noise, or would that be something that could be done? No, I think it could. So you're saying, yeah, little l of t, you could you could make the, the position, the point of application of the force be variable yeah, itself. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking of like an amoeba or something where- No, that's you know, a good point, right? It's not wiggling its hips. In, yeah, in, yeah, yeah, you know, the, yeah. Yeah, an amoeba is specifically the type of thing I was right. not thinking about, right? Then you really have to do, I don't know, do a lot of- uh, uh, I don't know how to do an amoeba, I guess is the short answer, but even having a L of T, I don't really see any real problem with that. You could think of it as right now, there is in some sense, there is a little bit of that because, because the force fluctuates, you can think of that being due to L, L changing, right? A little bit. So that's all lumped in there in some sense. The fluctuations could be to a slight uncertainty about where this point is if I'm moving. But you're right, this would be a nice, a nice because, extension. Yeah, I mean, I guess I got the impression that this asymmetry induced by L is kind of critical because if you just imagined forces that could come anywhere sort of uh, with the uniform distribution over, over the particle, then it, would you expect it to still have this kind of swimming, additional swimming term in that case? I think so, as long as, it, well, because, you know, so thermal fluctuations don't do that, right? Thermal fluctuation don't cause a torque at the end of the day, right? right? So that's, that's, in some sense, the thermal limit is exactly what this does not happen. But again, I don't really see why the propulsion mechanism of an organism should be subjected to that, right? Again, if you have a flagellum, it's at the rear, of the swimmer or, or at the front or whatever. But the point is it's, even though you're right, the point where it's acting might be a little bit shifty and the shape of the mirrors might deform somewhat. It's pretty clear that it's not, it's preferentially acting on one side of the body rather than the other and therefore it's exerting torque, right? So even if things are happening in other places, et cetera, I would still expect some kind of net noise in the rotational direction, which is the kind of thing that is not caused by thermal fluctuations. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's really a fascinating model. I'm worried about the neglecting the 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 fluid inertia, right? That's what Alex Donev immediately said when I gave this talk at NYU. Um, on slide two, Alex kind of like said, "But what about this?" And I'm like, oh. <laughs> It's yeah, hard. I mean, well, it's hard. yeah, Alex, Alex is good at finding, finding, yeah, holes. yeah, yeah. So if he's saying he thinks that's important, it's uh, exactly. Yeah. So he made me very worried about this, and uh, I don't know how to put that in. I have to do one of two things I have to either put it in, which I think is the math is already a little hairy, and I don't want to make it too much hairier, um, or think of a limit where it doesn't matter, right. Yeah, I think, I mean, it seems like there should be particle systems where the fluid isn't that important. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. Well, as Alex was saying, if the mass of the particle is much bigger than the fluid, then you can neglect the fluid inertia. But of course, that's a weird situation, right? It's not often that you have active particles that are much heavier than the fluid. I mean, that's not, that's not the typical uh, limit. So, so we're still thinking about that a little bit, actually, what how to justify this model mm -hmm. properly. Do we have any other questions for you? All right, I think we'll just wrap up here for today. I'd like to thank our speaker, Yang again, and everyone for participating.
um, have a nice day and I will hopefully see you all next time. Bye everyone. Thank you.